gateway to Israel. The city sweeps down from the peak of Mount Carmel to its bay along the rim of the Mediterranean. Fifty years ago, this was a tiny, half-dead fishing village. Now, it's one of the largest, best-equipped ports in the Middle East. For centuries, Israel has been a magnet for pilgrims and travelers. Today, along the wharves of Haifa, tourists come stepping down the gangplanks of ships from 30 nations, including Israel's own luxury liners, on regular passenger runs to Genoa and Naples, Marseille and New York. Across these docks in a single year pass a million and a half tons of cargo. Exports including everything from automobiles to oranges. Along the foot of Carmel runs the broad avenue of Independence Way, lined with shipping agencies, with banks and bookstores. Here also are the business offices of Haifa's industries, glass and steel, soap and cement. A 20th century city standing tall above the shore where once Phoenician sailors made their port of call. From Haifa, the Mediterranean curved south to Tel Aviv, the largest city in the state of Israel. Its streets swarming with half a million citizens, diamond cutters and violin players from the symphony orchestra, weavers who make the nation's textiles, and printers who put out most of her newspapers. As cities go, Tel Aviv is a babe in arms. It isn't hard to find grandfathers who can remember when all this was nothing but empty sand dunes. A city with two constant voices, the clash of traffic along the avenues and the sound of the sea, where along the water's edge rises a row of modern hotels. On weekend afternoons, Tel Aviv spills out onto her beaches. Native-born Sabras and new immigrants from the ghettos of Baghdad and Marrakesh, mixing with visitors from London and Kansas City. Along the waterfront promenade, one is more than likely to run into a cab driver discussing Shakespeare, or a delivery boy quoting the Song of Songs. For this is the cultural heart of Israel, a city that flocks to hear Heifetz and Yehudi Menuhin, a city that supports a top-flight symphony orchestra and five dramatic companies, including the world-famous Habima Theater. Entertainment running from Beethoven to Cinemascope. Out beyond the city line, on the highway to Jerusalem, the tempo changes. The road twisting through the quiet Judean hills, these slopes where once Joshua smote the Canaanites where 2,000 years ago, the Maccabees gathered to fight for freedom, and where only yesterday, the troops of this newborn Jewish state broke through to lift the siege of Jerusalem, giving the highway a new name, Kvish Hagbura, the road of courage, circling up through the terraced hills toward the towers of the holy city. Jerusalem a city whose roots go back to the dim beginnings of history. Modern streets running now through the valley where Solomon built his temple, where Isaiah thundered his prophecies, birth is given to spacious parks. The ancient wall with its great stone gates looks out on a new city, the white tower of the YMCA rising above a cluster of churches, holy shrines drawing pilgrims from every corner of the globe. Here in the city that King David chose for his capital, the descendants of David have set up their seat of government. At the chief executive's office, foreign diplomats come to present their credentials. Newly arrived ambassadors are saluted with all the ceremony of international protocol. Jerusalem is pomp and dignity, but turn south again and it's another world. Beersheba. It sprawls at the edge of the desert, the place where 4,000 years ago the patriarch Abraham watered his flocks.
Beersheba, a metropolis in the making. New housing shooting up, new suburbs spreading out. A frontier boom town whose theme song is the clang of a carpenter's hammer. The ring of a bricklayer's trowel. The barren flatland suddenly giving birth to a movie house with parking stalls for cars and camels. A deserted field giving rise to a new hospital. The dusty edge of the wilderness transformed into a residential section with a crisscross of new streets laid out by crews of immigrants from Iraq and Bulgaria, from Turkey and North Africa. The city has a proud past. At the Beersheba Museum, there are relics that go back to the time of the patriarchs. It was somewhere near here that David slew the Philistine giant, Goliath. It was in the surrounding desert that Hagar and her son Ishmael wandered, dying of thirst. And then in the words of Genesis, God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And only a little way from here stand the ruins of Ascalon, the ancient town mentioned in young David's famous cry of anguish when he heard of the death of King Saul and his beloved friend Jonathan. Tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ascalon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Coming down in a direct line from biblical days are the Bedouins, nomad tribes of shepherds and wheat farmers, now also citizens of Israel. Out in the desert, a government clinic has been set up to provide them with medical treatment. An Arabic-speaking doctor coming out from Beersheba to persuade them to try aspirin and iodine and sulfur in place of their ancient remedies, which include paste made of soap boiled in olive oil as a treatment for bullet wounds and bread baked by a widow to cure diseases of the evil eye. Once a week, the Bedouins desert their black tents in the wilderness and take to the road, whole families streaming in toward the market in Beersheba. This is the trading center for all of Israel's frontier, supplying the needs of the vast sweep of the Negev, stretching from Gaza west to the Dead Sea and south across the burned hills to the Gulf of Aqaba. The Bedouins and their camels make the marketplace a favorite class tour for the city's school children. An expedition that's half picnic and half zoology lesson. A living exhibit portraying a way of life that hasn't changed in ten centuries. The streets of Beersheba's old quarter are lined with the tiny shops of merchants offering anything from a silver bracelet to a quick haircut. The air rings with the cries of vendors selling everything from peanut oil to pickled lemons. In from the desert come the soldiers who patrol the frontier highways and guard the border settlements. Twenty-four hours leave in Beersheba means a chance to shake off the dust and relax and taste the treats of civilization. A chance to check up on the latest football scores, to find out what's playing at the local movies. A chance to get the lowdown on world events from an expert. Just beyond Beersheba, at Yuval Gad, stands the factory turning out irrigation pipe that is helping to transform the face of the land. Three years ago, some of these workmen were still living in a medieval ghetto in Yemen. Now their trained hands make possible the pipelines that are slowly turning the desert green, carrying water across the parched slopes of the Negev from Beersheba to Be'er Ora, 
bringing alive the promise of Genesis. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. Irrigation making possible a new life for Indian immigrants from Calcutta and Cochin. One village out of hundreds springing up now in the sunlit hills south of Beersheba. The dry earth giving way to vegetable gardens. The past giving way to a ripening future. Out of Beersheba too stretches another kind of lifeline. The new highway curving eastward through the mountains to Sodom on the Dead Sea, the place where once the Lord rained down brimstone and Lot's wife, looking back, was turned to a pillar of salt. Out of this inland sea, the lowest spot on the face of the earth, the great shovels dredge up mineral salts, potassium chloride and sodium chloride, calcium and magnesium, to be shipped out after being dried by the blazing sun and the desert winds. At the edge of the Dead Sea stands the potash refinery, turning out the precious chemical at the rate of 150,000 tons a year. Working in merciless heat, these miners dig out the raw material to be turned into fertilizer to enrich the fields of the Galilee and the Emek, and sulfuric acid to supply the industries of Haifa. The natural resources of the Negev have made possible the development of a dozen basic industries. Out of these ancient craters comes the kaolin that produces pottery and porcelain, and the fine sand goes to make glass, and phosphates to fulfill all the needs of Israel, with enough left over to be shipped out as far as Sweden and Japan. The wheel of tomorrow turns on Beersheba and her citizens. Immigrants from 56 nations, tough-handed pioneers in a frontier town at the edge of the wilderness. Makers and builders, masons and stonecutters carving out a new future. In this land of Israel, there are cities rooted in yesterday and cities that echo the tempo of this morning. But Beersheba is the city that rings with the promise of tomorrow.